and if you have any questions, um, like I said, please send a message through, to, through the chat or um, save it until the end of the program. Thanks for joining us. All right, thanks, Trish. First thing, hope everybody can hear me. If you can't, please send a message right now. I'd also like to uh, thank everybody, or first of all, apologize. Sorry that uh, this originally was, we were going to give this last week and that didn't happen. But I'm glad for those of you that were able to make this week. Um, as Trish indicated, we've got uh, quite a few people on this call, which is great. And looking at the list of attendees, it looks like we've got pretty much the entire gamut covered. Uh, got quite a few uh, component manufacturers, uh, some trust design engineers. It looks as if we've got some what we would call building designers and um, even a couple of contractors. So what, um, if you had questions as we're going through this, please uh, send the messages in. Um, if we can, I'll try to address them as we receive the questions. Uh, but if not, I'm hoping that we'll have uh, at least about five minutes uh, or a little bit more at the end of the presentation uh, to be able to take questions. All right, <clears throat> moving along then. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is the, um, the focus of this uh, presentation, I'm going to be basically referring to metal plate connected wood trusses. Uh, but a lot of the uh, information that I'm going to be talking about today uh, would be applicable, whether it's an engineered wood eye joist, uh, cold form steel truss, what have you. So um, those of you that maybe have a certain focus or, or bent uh, that uh, don't be offended if I keep referring to metal plate connected wood trusses or wood trusses. Okay, uh, building codes require the building structures and parts thereof to be designed and constructed for strength and serviceability. Um, ensuring adequate strength is obviously very important as this ensures that the structure or member will be safe. Um, serviceability establishes in, established in both the IBC and the IRC by deflection limits are basically meant to ensure that the building or member remains useful. Now, you can get into some situations where a serviceability issue can become more of a strength issue, and we'll talk about that here briefly. But usually, serviceability issues are kind of marginalized by strength. I mean, when we're designing trusses or sizing an eye joist or what have you, um, we are typically be, tend to be more focused on that member being able to safely support the design loads. Uh, so that we don't end up creating an unsafe structure. Um, however, I think most of the component manufacturers on this call can probably attest to uh, that the vast majority of complaints that are received usually have to do with serviceability issues, whether it's deflection or vibration or something on that order. Um, one thing to just always to keep in mind, the current building codes provide minimum design requirements, whether that's from a strength standpoint or from a deflection standpoint. Those are the minimum requirements. Another way of putting it that uh, gentlemen I used to work with used to say is um, that basically is the absolute worst you can do and still be legal. Um, so when you hear somebody that is touting the fact that they design to the building code or they build to the building code, that really doesn't mean anything. That's basically the minimum bar level that you can go to. Um, with the deflection criteria that's specified in the building code, they also do defer to referenced standards for the element or finish material if more restrictive deflection limits are required. Um, and the key there is a reference standard. TPI-1, for instance, the uh, design standard for design and construction standard for metal plate connected wood trusses is a referenced standard in the building code. Um, and then there's other examples of reference standards. Uh, for instance, the national design specification for wood is a reference standard that having to do with basic wood design. And um, so if those documents would require tighter deflection criteria for whatever reason, the code would defer to the requirements in those standards. 
Um, there's several manufacturers or trade associations often recommend more stringent deflection requirements to address serviceability or appearance of a variety of products. And this would include uh, gypsum floor topping, uh, lightweight concrete topping, ceramic or porcelain floor tile, natural stone flooring, including marble, and uh, composite stone flooring. And so depending on what's being used, it, it really helps to have information from the manufacturer or trade association, um, not only from a design standpoint, but also from an, uh, an installation standpoint to make sure that you're getting it right. In the building codes, and what I'm basically referring to here is this is chapter or table 1604.3, which lists the deflection limits um, for various applications and, and members. And this is out of the 2015 edition of the International Building Code. And uh, I'm sure most of you have probably seen this or are familiar with it. The Column, I'm sorry, my pointer's not working either, so that I'll try to uh, be descript in my, uh, as I'm talking about this. The column on the far right-hand side is basically a dead load plus live load, okay? And a lot of this information, again, you've seen for roof members, they talk about a um, L over 240 if you're supporting plaster or stucco ceiling, which would be considered more of a brittle finish. Um, supporting a non-plaster ceiling, L over 180, uh, not supporting a ceiling, L over uh, 120, where L is the clear span. Uh, for floor members, the total load deflection, D plus L, is L over 240. Okay, now there's a couple of footnotes that are included with um, that dead plus live load. And the first one is D, and the second one is G and it uh, sometimes pays to read the footnotes in the table. Again, this is out of the 2015 edition of the building code. Um, those of you on this call that have been around long enough or have are old enough to remember the uniform building code, which basically was in a, uh, one of the regional codes that covered the Western United States and um, was enforced up until the early 2000s. Um, what we're going to talk about next really has been in the building codes all along, but it kind of got, as, as the IBC uh, was developed, uh, this distinction, if you will, uh, kind of got lost in the, um, and th what they've done is they've, they've, they're kind of doing a better job now of uh, defining. But footnote D says, and I apologize, there's a lot of words here, but the deflection limit for dead load plus live load combination only applies to the deflection due to creep component of the long-term deflection or long-term dead load deflection plus short-term live load deflection okay what they're basically saying there is that according to the IBC a total load deflection of dead load plus live load really only includes the instantaneous deflection from live load and the instantaneous or the, the debt or excuse me the creep component of the instantaneous dead load deflection or the creep component of the dead load deflection or another way to think about it is it basically is saying okay when you're building a building and you're installing let's say floor trusses and you're installing the dead load components that are going on those floor trusses that they have to support, those floor trusses, there's an instantaneous deflection occurring as you add the dead load to that truss. What the IBC dead load plus live load deflection criteria is based on is taking, once all the dead loads on that truss, and it's let's say that truss is deflected a quarter inch, based on all the dead load that's applied to it, okay? That's establishing uh, the bar at zero. So now the total load deflection that the building codes re is interested in is now if I add the live load to that truss, I'm gonna get a, an additional deflection, let's say it's a half inch. So I've got the instantaneous or the initial dead load deflection of a quarter inch, and then the live load deflection of a half inch, so I would measure three quarters of an inch. 
And then the building code is interested in the creep component of that dead load deflection, which in many instances for seasoned wood in a dry service application over the life of that structure is probably going to be, or is considered to be basically equal to the instantaneous dead load deflection. So the overall deflection, starting from when you first put that truss in to once it's fully a live load plus the creep factor that's thrown in there would be half inch plus one quarter plus one quarter. But the dead plus live that's listed in this table in the building code is really only interested in the live load deflection plus the creep component, so half inch plus one quarter. That's basically what this is saying, and that's for seasoned wood in a dry use application. The other footnote that I bring attention to would be footnote G, which says for steel structural members, the dead load shall be taken as zero. Okay, when one first looks at this, you're looking at that and they're saying it's a dead load plus live load combination, but for steel, I can ignore the dead load. Well, why is that? Again, that's just showing that this building code, this criteria is more concerned with not the instantaneous dead load deflection, but any dead load deflection and live load deflection that can occur over time. And for steel, steel is not a, a, a material that is subject to uh, long-term deflection due to sustained loads. So as a result, you really only need to worry about the live load deflection when you're designing for steel. But for wood, that's not the case. So, but you're allowed to basically just take the live load deflection plus the component of the dead load deflection only due to creep. And we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a, as we, we go through this. Um, so <clears throat> what do we mean by creep? Well, uh, contrary to what my wife might tell you, we're not talking about me in this particular instance. Um, basically, creep is defined as time-dependent deformation of a structural member under constant load. Key concept there, under constant load. When you're designing a floor truss, let's say for uh, typical residential construction, 40 pounds per square foot live load, and let's say uh, 10 pounds per square foot top core dead load and 5 pounds per square foot bottom core dead load. Okay, of that loading, the only real component of a const the constant load component would be the dead load, plus any sustained live load, such as say a well, not to date myself, but like a waterbed, or you know scenarios where you could end up having it's a it's a not really considered a dead load, but it's it's there from on a sustained you know, over the life of the structure, there's a good chance that that load's going to be there all the time. That's what we mean by a constant load or a sustained load. Um, another way of thinking about creep, if you would, is kind of like a load duration. If um, You know, humans are also subjected to creep. Um, if you hold a textbook out at, the, at, the, at arm's length, uh, chances are everybody on this call could do that, okay? But if you were to hold that or ask to be hold that for, say, a day and not move, uh, the weight's not changing, but the time frame is. And eventually there's going to be fatigue and you're probably going to end up dropping that, that book. Um, and wood is really no different. And what this uh, graphic shows you is basically creep can be considered in three parts, basically. There's primary, there's secondary and there's tertiary. And most of the designs that we're involved with are really fall into that primary range where you, when you put a sustained load on a member, uh, you're going to come up with an initial deflection. And then as that sustained load stays on that member, typically what you're going to do is eventually you're going to end up that def the member is going to continue to deflect but at a decreasing rate. And eventually, um, it won't, just again, due to that sustained load, it won't deflect anymore. Um, there are factors that affect the how much creep you have to be concerned with. And it has to do with an increased stress level, 
moisture content and temperature. That's why it's so critical in terms of knowing if you're going to if the truss is going to be used in a situation where there's the moisture or the uh, relative humidity is going to be you know greatly fluctuating. Uh, if you're going to end up having situations where the relative humidity is going to be a lot higher than uh, over time, uh, like let's say a truss a roof truss over a swimming pool or something like that, where the potential is there that you can have high moisture or high relative humidity, therefore high moisture content, higher moisture content in that uh, that the wood members. Um, what this curve basically within the primary region of creep where where we want to be, um, basically if you have your sustained load is less than or equal to about one half of your ultimate short term load. In other words, the load that would, if you test that member, typically the test is going to occur within, your, you're going to have failure within five minutes and you're ramping that load up. Um, you want the sustained load to basically be less than half of what the ultimate load is. As long as that's the case, you're going to be within that primary creep where, yes, you will get some deformation over and above the instantaneous dead load deflection, but eventually that uh, that rate is going to decrease, or, or the rate of it's going to decrease, and ultimately you'll end up where it'll uh, once it'll remain constant. Um, you don't want to get into a secondary or tertiary because what's happening there is the rate of strain is increasing over time and eventually you can go from uh, the serviceability issue to where that member will actually fail. And that typically can happen if you, uh, well, I guess a good example would be if you miss the fact that you've got a lot of, most of your load on that member is due to dead load. Uh, examples would be, um, let's say, supporting brick. Uh, now, the building code and TPI have limits in terms of, you know, what the deflection criteria has to be, and then that takes care of, uh, of the sustained load. But heavy sustained loads, you need to take a closer look at. Um, one of the examples that uh, I know I've been involved with, and I don't even know if people are building earth homes anymore, but I know about 20 years ago, um, we were involved in a situation where an architect had um, designed a earth home for a homeowner and had designed the uh, total dead load to basically be about a foot and a half of soil on, this, on the trusses, uh, where the soil obviously was providing the... Um, uh, the, the, you know, was the covering on the, over the roof. And uh, unfortunately, in one of the details, uh, which didn't show any dimensions or anything like that, but there were parapets around this, this building, or at least the front of it, where it came out of the hill, um, the detail showed uh, that there's like a three foot tall parapet. Um, the load that, that they had designed it for would have been say about a foot and a half. But that particular detail uh, mistakenly showed the soil uh, going up to just about uh, flush, well, a couple inches beneath the depth of the parapet. So what they actually had on that roof, because uh, that's, that's the detail that the homeowner who was building this home himself locked in on. So instead of having a foot and a half of soil on the roof, he had more like about three feet of soil on the roof. And eventually those trusses, which were basically uh, low slope or, or uh, parallel core trusses that were supporting the soil load, um, they failed. Uh, it wasn't a catastrophic failure, but uh, you suddenly had a huge uh, drop in your ceiling. So again, you want to stay as long as for most applications that metal plate connected wood trusses are involved in, it's not really that, you know, you typically don't have to worry about it. Um, but certainly, Whenever you get into situations where your dead load is um, a substantial amount compared to the total load or your live load, you want to start paying attention to creep and also to uh, deflection requirements. The IRC is a, a lot simpler. Um, they really don't get into the creep deflection requirements or anything like that. and um, you know, depending upon how the product is used, that's where they basically um, 
include the requirements. So in this case, it's Chapter 6. They include requirements for floor uh, installation, including, in, including for floors with the floor topping products covered in this presentation. So again, we're going to start getting into some of these different uh, toppings that can be used and, and some of the concerns that need to be looked at. Um, when you go to ANSI TPI-1, again, this is the 2014 edition that I'm going to be referring to, um, you have Section 7.6 provides guidance for deflection limits for trusses, and the TPI-1 2014 has been updated to account for the recent clarifications in the IBC regarding creep. Okay, so again, uh, those of you on the call that are involved with trust design, uh, if you don't have a copy of TPI-1, you need to get a copy. Uh, hopefully, you all have one in your design department office um, and become familiar with it, not only the standard, but also the commentary. There's a lot of good information in there. Okay, so um, this table, again, sets deflection limits, suggested deflection limits for trusses. Um, at first glance, there's a lot of information here that is very similar to what's in the IBC and the table that we just looked at. Um, the first column on the left-hand side describes what member we're looking at. So roof truss supporting plaster, roof truss supporting drywall, roof truss not supporting ceilings, floor trusses, um, top cord panel, and habitable spaces in trusses. Okay, And the second column from the left provides the deflection criteria due to live load only. And again, this if you looked in the building code and compared it with what's shown here, you're going to find that it basically is you know no surprises. The change that they made, however, is if you look in the older versions, uh, like say the 2007 TPI-1, um, they provided a total load column, whereas now to uh, align the new TPI, TPI 2014, with what the IBC is getting at in terms of the dead load plus live load. Um, the, they now include a column that says deflection due to live load plus the creep component of deflection due to dead load. And then they do still have a total load deflection column, which would be the car, column on the right-hand side. A couple of footnotes I want to point out, and I apologize if you can't really read these, but um, footnote two says, certain floor coverings require more restrictive deflection criteria. For ceramic tile, trusses, spacing, and appropriate dead load for the installation method and other aspects of, the de of design, per an ANSI standard A108, A118, and A136, shall be such that the system passes the requirements of the building designer per chapter two of this standard. And we'll, touch, we'll touch on that here in a minute. Um, also note number five, where required by ACI 530 and TMS 402 for trusses used as a beam or lentil, providing support of mas uh, v vertical masonry veneer, a minimum of L over 600 deflection limit, shall apply. Okay, so the total load deflection in this table is basically just as it used to be, where you've got the live load component plus the dead load component. Now TPI does not specify a creep factor. Again, this is in the 2014 edition. Um, if you go back to the 2007 edition, it basically would show this equation, delta total load equals delta live load times a creep factor, K sub CR plus dead load. In this current version now, it's basically just showing the total load deflection is equal to live load deflection plus the dead load deflection. Doesn't indicate uh, or specify a creep factor being applied to dead load, that doesn't mean it couldn't, but in this case the building designer would have to indicate that that's what they're interested in. This deflection, as it's currently shown, basically is really only interested in the instantaneous deflection due to live load and the instantaneous deflection due to dead load. 
if you're interested in the time dependent deformation under long term loading, that is now the uh, identified as the deflection due to long term uh, for long term deflection is equal to a creep component times the immediate deflection to the long term component of the design load plus the deflection due to any short term or normal component design load where k sub cr the creep factor is either 2 for trusses used in using season lumber and used in dry service conditions or 3 for trusses using green lumber or wet service conditions and then the delta long term is defined as a long term deflection due to the immediate deflection of both the short term and the long term loads and the creep deflection of the long term loads and then the delta lt is the immediate deflection due to long term component of the design load immediate deflection due to the portion of the load which is the immediate deflection due to the portion of the load considered to be present over a sustained period of time which is typically the dead load delta st is the deflection due to the short term or normal component of the design load so that's the deflection basically due to transient loads which are typically live loads for purposes with basically matching what's in the IBC the delta creep value is now the same that's this column that's the third column in this table that's really what the um, IBC is this this value here would be compared with what the IBC currently has in for its dead load plus live load and that deflection is calculated as the live load component of the deflection plus the dead load component of the deflection instantaneous times the creep factor minus one and again where the creep factor is two for season lumber and three for wet service so again what the delta CR is is we're looking at the deflection due to transient loads live load and only the component of the dead load deflection due to creep. Aren't you glad you got a computer program that'll take all that into account? The main thing is is getting the K sub CR factor correct. And who comes up with that K sub CR factor? In terms of design responsibilities, dead loads associated with floor covering products may significantly affect design limitations from strength, deflection, and creep. So it's very important that the building designer provides the truss designer with the information that they need to correctly design the trusses. And section, we've got uh, part of section 2.3.2.4 from TPI1 here. And if you look at, again, this is information that needs to be included in the construction documents. And you look if you look, look at uh, item G, where it lists criteria related to serviceability issues. It lists the whole, uh, there's five different items included here. And item four in particular, or excuse me, item five, is any deflection and vibration criteria for floor trusses, including strong back bridging requirements, and any dead load, live load, and in-service creep deflection criteria for the floor trusses supporting stone or ceramic tile finishes. Again, typically if it's just a regular carpet pad or, or linoleum, um, creep's not going to be an issue because your dead load component, you know, and again, keep in mind, we're talking about the actual sustained loads, not necessarily the design stain, sustained loads. Um, you know, if you actually added the weights and materials, a lot of times a 10 and 5 top cord, uh, bottom cord dead load um, design, loads uh, design dead load are, are conservative we're talking about the actual sustained loads but where you really have to start paying attention to that is when you start adding getting into some of these more brittle finishes or topping where you're adding additional dead load to that truss for whatever reason whether it's a um, because of they, they want to go with like an in-floor heating system or there's a uh, 
a certain uh, fire rated assembly that they're 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 trying to uh, that they're, they're building to that requires some type of a topping, or they want to install tile, whether that's ceramic or stone. Um, and then the question to ask is, well, what what uh, type of installation method are they using? Are they going to be using, is it a more of a thin set, um, the tile over the, uh, you know, with, with very little uh, a mortar bed or whatever, or they're basically, is the mortar bed going to be rather thick? Because that's all going to be adding additional weight. And that's all information that ideally would be provided by the building designer which I realize from residential construction, uh, there are many times where the trust designer, uh, they don't even realize or they had no clue that they were going to be putting um, tile or stone on the trusses to begin with. Okay, so what are some deflection considerations when you're designing floor trusses? Well, uh, one thing with floor trusses, they obviously, uh, and, and, and trusses in general, or engineered wood for that matter, um, it allows you to go with much more open floor plans, um, and which then allows for you know fewer partitions, longer spans, more open space. That's great, um, but some of the conventional deflection criteria then really doesn't uh, may not provide the type of floor system that the owner thinks is a good floor system, um, and so you can uh, you know the code base typically bases the deflection requirements uh, based on deflection ratios clear span divided by a number um, some things to consider and I know the most of the software provides this is you can also limit the deflection based on a finite number as an example L over 360 but not to exceed one half inch There's, um, other concerns would be, again, the special deflection requirements for the floor finishes. Um, poured topping materials, you have to account for the added weight of the topping, which, depending upon what they're using, can vary greatly. If it's a lightweight, more of a gypsum-type topping, that can be as much as 9 pounds per square foot per inch of topping, additional load. If it's standard weight, that can be as much as 12 pounds per square foot per inch of topping. And then you've got the specific requirements for the more brittle floor coverings, such as ceramic, glass, or stone tile. So poor toppings. Um, although poor topping industry does not appear to really provide any generic information, uh, typically what's followed would be the live load deflection, L over 360, total load deflection, L over 240. Um, poor topping, again, it depends on what's being used. In this case, like the gypsum base topping is about seven pounds per square foot for three quarter inch topping. One inch of concrete based, again, is 12 pounds per square foot. Now, what you don't want to run into is a situation that uh, really, well, many years ago, more than I guess I care to remember, when I was an engineer working for Trust Joyce, uh, we had a situation where the um, uh, a apartment complex was built and they were using a uh, one of the iJoyce products. Um, they had a this was in the Portland, Oregon area. They had a bunch of rain, and so the iJoyce and all the um, the sheathing got very wet. Um, the original uh, the, the 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 plans called for using uh, the three quarter inch gypsum base topping, but they ended up using a um, full concrete based. And the additional weight of the concrete based and the fact that uh, everything was wet when this was all poured um, resulted in uh, a bit more deflection in the floor than what they were anticipating. And so the contractor in this case, in order to solve the problem, decided to add more concrete topping uh, to finally be able to level this floor. And I believe what happened was uh, ended up doubling, I think, the, the thickness of the concrete in, in several spots. Um, nobody knew about this other than the contractor um, until about six or seven months after the building was finished off and suddenly they were having a bunch of problems with the doors where they couldn't um, open and close them. So the first time it, uh, they had this problem, they came out and they had to you know, basically uh, readjust the doors. 
to the various units. Well, when it happened again about six months later, that's when they got uh, contacted us. And that was a situation where um, initially we were concerned that maybe we were past the primary uh, creep zone and we're starting to get into the secondary or even the tertiary. Um, so again, uh, the additional weight, got to pay attention to it and knowing what the products are because uh, there are differences. So where do you get information regarding uh, brittle floor coverings? One excellent source is this handbook for ceramic, glass, and stone tile installation. This is by the Tile Council of North America, TCNA. Now, in this bulletin, or they actually have a technical bulletin, you go online, um, you can go to their website, um, you'll have to buy the, um, the handbook, but they do have several downloads, uh, frequently asked questions zone and so forth. But one of the things they state is that uh, recent research has shown that tiles will fail or have failed uh, under con even more rigid floor conditions than what they may specify. In fact, failures of, uh, for L over 600 have been observed. It's for this reason that the recommendations for floor rigidity are not based on deflection measurements, but on empirically established methods found to work over normal con code construction. So what they're basically saying is that they've, obviously they're gonna provide some deflection criteria. However, a lot of the, um, assemblies that are listed in this handbook are based on tried and true methods. And that's why it's critical that those tried, that those assemblies are pretty much followed to the letter. Now as a trust manufacturer, you have no control over that. The whole reason I'm really getting into the into depth here is because know that all you can do is design your trusses to the deflection criteria that either you're given or what the various uh, reference standards would say for the application. And also, some of these may have some limits in terms of what the on-center spacing is supposed to be. Um, there's other factors involved that have to be considered uh, that are beyond your scope that the building designer needs to pay attention to and the contractor or the builder. So when it comes to deflection in a floor assembly, it's not just the trusses or the eye joists. Um, you can have deflection along the truss, obviously, that's what you're looking at, but there's also a deflection in the sheathing between the trusses, which can be critical when it comes to some of these brittle floor, brittle floor finishes. You can also have differential movement between the adjacent trusses, um, and that can be important too, and that's something that you know you can pay attention to when you're designing the trusses, obviously. Um, but each of the deflection criteria is applicable, or the deflection criteria, I should say, that's, that's specified is applicable to any of these components. So even though many times that people like to blame the, uh, the trusses, there's usually a lot more going on there. Okay, some other things to keep in mind is the um, differential expansion <clears throat> of the products, okay? And what affects that? Well, moisture content. Um, the amount that the wood is going to move if it gets wet is going to be different than how much the grout will move or say the underlayment if it's a non-wood-based product or even if it is a wood-based product, how much it, it's going to move. Now typically in a um, tiled floor application, uh, it, it, you're, it's never gonna get so wet that you have to worry about the trusses getting wet. However, one thing to keep in mind is that there are very few tile installations that are perfectly waterproof. And unless a waterproof membrane is installed, even just a constant mopping or exposure to heavy wetting can eventually cause problems because that moisture is going to uh, seep down and it ultimately could start affecting the underlayment component of that floor assembly, which then can call, cause some swelling and movement and can lead to cracking of the grout or even of the tile. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is with radiant heating systems, um, you know, heat can certainly have an effect and, you know, there's differential uh, thermal coefficients between the materials, but typically with radiant heat, uh, you're not talking temperatures high enough to make that of any concern. But the thing with radiant heat is the heating elements 
can create weak points in the concrete topping that they're embedded in. And so unless uh, some type of a um, anti-fracture membrane is used, those because you got the weak points, that can cause cracking in the topping, which can end up propagating or transmitting into the grout and even the tile. So just some things that uh, certainly come into play. Um, if you look in the handbook, they've got just a myriad of assemblies, okay, whether it's assemblies on directly on concrete or, or on steel or what have you. There are t currently 23 floor systems that they provide in the handbook that utilize plywood and one OSB, okay? Now again, as a trust designer, not really your problem. But um, if you take a look at, this is kind of critical, <laughs> um, there's obviously a difference between plywood and OSB. Um, I, I tend to think there's a lot of people that don't understand that. I mean, they obviously look different, but um, in most parts of the country, if you order wood structural sheathing for your floor, you're gonna get OSB. Yet, when you look in the tile council, or the handbook, the vast majority of acceptable floor systems only use plywood. Of the 23, eight of the assemblies require two layer all plywood assemblies. And what we mean by that is a structural subfloor plus an underlayment. Six of the 23 allow the supporting members to be spaced at 24 inches on center, okay? Your floor trusses, typically you're gonna be designing at 24 inches on center. So if they're using a uh, tiled floor assembly, hopefully they're using an assembly that allows the supporting members to be 24 inches on center. Two permit supporting members to be spaced at 19.2 on center, and the remaining require that the supporting members have to be spaced at 16 inches on center or less. Now, again, you can design the truss so that it's gonna be stiff enough that it doesn't matter what the on-center spacing is. The real concern is what's that sheathing, the subfloor, the underlayment, spanning between the trusses, how stiff is that? And is that gonna provide a, a, enough of a support that you won't have problems with the, the tile? Subflooring and underlayment should also be installed with the strength axis perpendicular to the supports and with a 1 8 inch gap or space between the sheets, okay? Now, from my days when I worked for a uh, certification company that certified OSB and, and plywood manufacturing plants and was involved in the wood structural sheathing side of it. Um, I know for a fact that typically most builders, when they're out there, they're installing a tongue and groove panel, they're gonna knock that thing tight, okay? Not supposed to. You're basically supposed to, yes, you're supposed to insert the tongue into the groove, but not knock it tight. Just snug it up, and that typically will provide a 1 8 inch gap. Same thing then at the ends of the panels. You don't butt them up tight over the supporting member. Provide a 1 1 8 inch gap. What do you mean by strength axis? Well, for plywood, that's basically the, the face veneers. It's the direction of the grain. For OSB, it can be kind of hard to, 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 to see sometimes, and that's why the OSB panels typically are marked with an arrow that shows what the strength axis is, which typically is in the eight foot direction of a four by eight panel, but doesn't always have to be. So um, you'll hear the term strength axis, that basically means the direction of the surface fibers or the, uh, the, the face veneers of the, uh, of the plywood or the, orient, the primary orientation of the strands in OSB panels. Um, just as an aside, the flexural stiffness of these products um, are typically, we're looking at um, about a four to one ratio. In other words, if you install the panels with the strength axis perpendicular to the supports, as opposed to orienting the panels with the strength axis parallel, um, it's the 
product is basically four times stiffer with a strength axis perpendicular versus installed parallel. Um, and so the underlayment is supposed to be installed and the subflooring is supposed to be installed with the um, strength axis perpendicular. Underlayment panels should be offset from, edge, uh, from the edges of the subflooring by six inches. Um, the underlayment panel should also be offset from the subfloor panel ends by one or more joist spaces plus at least two inches, six inches optimum. So the ends of the subfloor are going to be installed over the trusses, but the uh, underlayment is going to be offset so that the, it ends, the ends uh, of the underlayment basically are fall between the trusses. And each underlayment um, to subflooring should be attached with ring shank nails or screws and not to the floor joists or trusses. Again, we're talking underlayment there. So again, this is a single layer floor assembly right here, but with a strength axis installed perpendicular to the supports and panels are offset and then the um, underlayment panel would then be offset left, uh, basically six inches left of the uh, edge of the subfloor and at least one joist space plus two to six inches off from the ends. The what this basically is showing is from the um, handbook, the various assemblies, the six of them that uh, are listed that allow the use of um, the supports, at, uh, the trusses at 24 inches on center. And again, like I said before, most, uh, most of these are basically require uh, plywood to be used, not OSB. Um, there's additional information when it comes to application of brittle floor coverings. Uh, the APA has got a, a lot of good information. This uh, technical topic, TT006, um, basically kind of relists a lot of the assemblies that are, are, are included in the um, TCNA handbook. Now, one of the interesting things that this uh, TT006 has in there is that based on the prescriptive assemblies that are included in the uh, Tile Council document handbook, APA basically has come up with, okay, to meet the recommended L over 360 uniform load capacity requirement in uh, the TCNA document, this is the loading that you should basically be able to provide with the panels. Now, this has nothing to do with the load that's got to be applied to the floor, okay? Um, got to keep in mind, typically what is going to control in terms of keeping cracking of the ceramic tile or what have you has to do not only with uniform load, but with point loads, like loads from, say, a grand piano or um, more concentrated loads, okay? And now when you first look at this, you may think, well, man, how are we ever going to hit that? You know, these panels, if you look in the building code, I'm designing my floor for 40 pounds per square foot or 100 pounds per square foot if it's like commercial. Um, this is showing I got to design it for 550 or 750. No, that's basically showing the amount of load it should be able to support. Now, this has nothing to do with the trusses or the or eye joists or what have you. This is strictly the panel. But you still may wonder because a 2332nd um, 24 OC span rated single floor product, if you look in the building code, maximum lo uh, uniform load you're allowed to, to put on that is 100 pounds per square foot. This is saying it, it, I've got to go with uh, 550. Well, how can that be? Well, what you have to realize is the wood structural panels are qualified using a product standard where they have a set of minimum criteria and what APA has done and, and others, like uh, other agencies that certify these products, they have done some testing and actually developed engineered properties for these panels, um, recommended properties. And so what this table basically shows, and this is another document from APA, shows what a panel, in this case, uh, we'll look at, uh, if you go down to where it says 24 OC uh, with a live load deflection criteria of L over 360, and my support's at 24 uh, inches on center. I can support 
143 pounds per square in, or per square foot. So you would use a table like this, and not the building designer would use a table like this then to determine and make sure, verify that their assembly is providing enough stiffness and strength uh, when it comes to the underlayment and subfloor that's being used. So what are some application requirements for using ceramic tile and natural stone? Well, for ceramic tile installations, maximum allowable floor member total load and concentrated load deflection for framed floor systems shall not exceed L over 360. And I have in parentheses one half inch maximum. I've seen some specifications which limit the finite deflection, total load deflection to one half inch. Again, where L is the clear span of the supporting member per the applicable building code. For natural stone tile installations, that maximum allowable floor member total load and concentrated load deflection for wood frame systems shall not exceed L over 720. And again, I've also seen in other specifications where they limit that total load deflection to 7 over 32. Um, Again, not to beat a dead horse here, but it's important to know um, when they're installing this tile, what type of bedding are they installing it into? Because one inch thick mortar bed can weigh as much as 12 pounds per square foot. The Marble Flooring Association, uh, Marble Institute of America, lists other, also has information. And again, if you look at 3.83, says uh, frame construction, the subfloor areas over the stone tile, excuse me, subfloor areas over which stone tile is to be applied must be designed to have a deflection not exceeding L over 720 of the span. In calculating the load, the weight of the stone and setting bed must be considered. And again, they provide that information that the mortar bed weight for estimating purposes, mortar bed weight can be approximated by 0.7 five pounds per square foot per one sixteenth of thickness. And the stone weight for estimating purposes is approximated as one pound per square foot per one sixteenth of thickness. Um, obviously the tile and the mortar bed is probably going to be thicker than one sixteenth so you need to take that into account. Differential deflection. Another issue that needs to be considered. Yeah, differential deflection is defined as relative deflection of adjacent trusses. The building designer per TPI 1 2.3.2.4 is responsible for specifying any of these limitations regarding differential deflection. Um, conditions that need to be looked at closely for where differential deflection may be objectionable would be a bearing wall continuously um, supports one truss in a series of trusses otherwise supported only at their ends. Trusses in a hip system where shallower or more heavily loaded girder truss is adjacent to deeper common trusses. Um, trusses with flat bottom cord uh, that are adjacent to uh, an opening in the building where there's scissor trusses. And then an another concern would be where partition walls are oriented parallel to the floor trusses especially those supporting cabinets or tile. So from a differential deflection standpoint, in the commentary of ANSI TPI-1, they do provide a method for addressing differential deflection. Now this is in the commentary. It's, this is a uh, non-mandatory part of the TPI-1. But what one suggestion that they make is that you differential deflection should be less than two times the spacing, on center spacing of the trusses divided by whatever the deflection limit is. So in other words, let's say two times 24 divided by 240. Uh, differential deflection certainly can happen. What you're looking at, the photo on the left, um, this is a room and attic trusses that uh, the bearing to bearing span was 37 feet. The trusses are running into the, into the slide and into the screen and out of the screen in that direction. Um, 
the first two trusses coming off the house, uh, there was a bump out uh, for a pantry. And so those trusses had supports basically close to their mid span. So their span was about half of what the, uh, the remaining trusses were. And so unfortunately, there happened to be a bathroom and a door uh, right in the location where you went from the trusses that were supported with you know, that additional support in the middle to trusses that were spanning the full 37 feet. And it became very obvious that there was a deflection problem. A uh, photo on the right-hand side showed how the, because of that deflection problem, uh, it was causing a crack coming off that uh, upper left-hand corner of the door. So again, very real problem. Um, mentioned about the partitions, uh, I'm, I include this. This is a section 6.2.2.1 out of TPI 1, uh, that, where it provides what the provisions for non-bearing partitions are. And it says that the weight of non-bearing partitions shall be permitted to be ignored for truss design purposes given the following conditions. First of all, the floor trusses are spaced less than or equal to 24 inches on center. The top cord panel lengths of the supporting trusses are less than or equal to 30 inches when the lumber is oriented in the flat direction. So in other words, four by two trusses. Design live load of supporting trusses results from a residential occupancy and is not less than 40 pounds per square foot. And the partition weight is less than or equal to 60 pounds per lineal foot. Um, a eight foot tall or nine foot tall uh, uh, non-bearing load partition wall with uh, framed with um, two by four studs at uh, 16 inches on center and half inch gypsum on both sides uh, will tip the scales at less than that 60 pounds, uh, or excuse me, 60 pounds per lineal foot. Um, also, it says non-bearing partition weight is not permitted to be ignored if the conditions listed above do not exist. The building diner designer then shall specify in the structural design documents the non-bearing partition loads that need to be applied to the trusses. And many times this is taken care of by adding a partition load weight, uh, which you'll certainly see on, on commercial jobs, many times not on in, in, in uh, residential construction. Non-load bearing partitions parallel to the supporting trusses. When a non-load bearing partition parallel to the supporting trusses are located on or immediately adjacent to a truss, the subfloor shall be adequate, have adequate strength and stiffness to support the non-bearing partition load, or other provisions shall be made by the building designer to distribute these loads to the trusses. That's why sometimes on plans you'll see where they've called out additional blocking, um, or in many cases I think they're just assuming that the 23 32nd inch uh, sheathing, if that's what's being used in the floor, is adequate to carry that load, which in most cases for residential construction it is. Um, Floor trusses can be designed for greater distances than obviously sawn lumber, uh, which enabled more open floor plans with fewer partitions, okay? The problem that occurs when uh, this happens is that um, while the trusses will easily meet the deflection requirements of the building code, because of the large open spaces, fewer partitions, you run the risk of getting uh, serviceability issues where the floor feels spongy or bouncy. And obviously floor vibration can have a negative effect on occupant satisfaction. Um, vibration, floor vibration is a serviceability issue that it's not directly addressed in the U.S. building codes. The building, US, the building codes in the United States typically try to limit deflection as a means of limiting vibration issues, but that does not always work. Um, research suggests that human response to varying levels of vibration can be very subjective. Uh, in other words, what I may think is a great floor, somebody else may think is a terrible floor. Um, what research has shown, however, is typically lower frequency vibrations tend to be more annoying, annoying than higher frequency vibrations. And floor systems with a natural frequency or fundamental frequency of about 8 to 10 hertz are typically considered less acceptable than those which, with a natural frequency of 14 hertz or greater. 
probably got about another about nine more slides so another five minutes and we'll be done um, here's a problem just waiting to happen uh, if you've a lot of times you've got these islands in this uh, you know residence in this case they've got what looks like a rather thick quartz or granite top which can run you know uh, shoot close to 20 pounds per square foot just due to the weight of that um, you've got a long uh, let's say that in this case this uh, floor was framed so that the framing uh, whatever supporting this is running uh, in screen and out of screen uh, so you've got a much longer span let's say if there's no beam this to break that span up you've got a much longer span supporting this uh, island and then you get over by where the kitchen table is and it looks to be a shorter span the way the, the house is um, you can run into uh, differential deflection issues with this but you can also run into deflection problems because as you excite this floor by walking across it and start the vibration, the dead load from this uh, heavy uh, kitchen island will create a uh, that low frequency vibration which people are going to notice. So definitely watch for applications like that. Okay, so here's a actual a uh, note that came off of a specification that we got a, a call from from a trust manufacturer, trust designer, where the engineer of record was saying floor trusses shall be braced with two by six minimum strong backs at 10 foot on center maximum. Okay, and we're going to see that that basically is right in line with what TPI 1 and BCSI would require. And that's to limit the perceived vibration. The floor trust designer shall design the trusses to a minimum frequency of 12 hertz to limit vibration effects. Okay, everything made sense probably until you saw that we're at 12 hertz. Well, geez, how do I do that? Well, there is some guidance provided, and, and I there was some research done at uh, Virginia Tech University several years ago where basically they came up with this equation. The natural frequency, and this is basically when I uh, step on a floor or you know apply a force from say footfall to a floor and then that floor is allowed to vibrate and it's going to reach its natural or uh, its natural frequency or fundamental frequency and to calculate that you use this equation that's shown up at the top which can simplify to the one at the right which basically is 0.18 times the square root of g divided by the dead load deflection where G is the acceleration due to gravity, which is 386 inches per square per second squared, and the dead load equals the deflection due to the actual dead load on the truss in inches. Okay, plug, you, you know what the actual deflection of the truss is due to the dead load, and you plug that into this equation, and that'll give you what the natural frequency of the truss is. And so from the previous slides, what we're shooting for, um, well, per that spec is, you want the natural frequency to be greater than or equal to 12 hertz. Um, the only other thing you need to be concerned with is that, again, vibration is more than just the truss and the, the floor assembly. It's, well, the entire system. And so if those floor trusses are supported in, uh, are attached to a girder, or a beam, you want to also consider the uh, natural frequency of those framing members as well and come up with a natural frequency for the entire system. Because you can have a great, uh, you know, design the trusses so that the uh, natural frequency of the trusses meet the requirements, but if the system natural frequency does not, that you could end up with some problems. And so this equation basically where you take the natural frequency of the truss times the natural frequency squared of the girder divided by the natural frequency of the truss plus the natural frequency of the girder squared, squared to that that gives you the natural frequency of the system. Um, what are some ways of reducing floor vibration? Well, one is to use quality materials and construction techniques. An example, glue and screw the floor sheathing to the truss, make sure the bearings are level, um, make sure that you know they're paying attention and following the requirements or the recommendations for the in in, in uh, using the right construction adhesives under for the temperature and moisture conditions um, following the installation 
instructions for the various materials. Again, uh, trust manufacturer has no control over that, but again, using good materials and construction techniques can go a long way. Um, another way is to use thicker sheathing, in other words, a larger span rating than what minimum may be required. So instead of using a 23 30 second inch panel for your floor sheathing, maybe you bump that up and they and design for us using a 7 8 thick panel or an inch and an eighth. Um, use more stringent deflection criteria. Uh, designing for L over uh, live, uh, live load deflection of uh, 480 or live load deflection of 600 or limiting the deflection to less than or equal to say one half inch. Another way uh, to reduce floor vibration would be to install directly applied rigid sealing, to increase the depth of the truss, shorten the span of the truss or framing member, use multiple span instead of simple span trusses. In other words, if you've got a, an intermediate bearing and instead of having two 10-foot uh, or 15-foot trusses tying into that, go with a 30-foot uh, long truss that is basically going to be supported have that intermediate bearing. Um, and then with trusses, we have the great advantage of also installing strong backing. And I'm going to talk about that to wrap this up here in a minute. But some means of that have been tried in, and are still tried to reduce the vibration issues, but have been found to be uh, fairly ineffective, would be to reduce the spacing of the floor framing adding a concrete topping, or poorly installed cross bridging and blocking. Now with trusses, we have a, a great advantage over other framing materials in that we can use or they can install strong backing. But it needs to be uh, installed per the requirements of TPI-1. And those requirements are minimum 2x6 lumber oriented vertically. Attach the strong backing to vertical web or field installed vertical 2x4 and attach it with a minimum of three 10D.131 by 3 inch nails. No gaps, it's got to be installed tightly. Install at a minimum of 10 foot on center intervals, rows of, of, of uh, strong backing along the span of the truss, maximum 10 foot on center with one row as close to the mid-span as possible. Strong backing should also be con as continuous as possible, and this is where it typically falls apart. Maybe the framer will get the strong backing in, and it's running from end wall to end wall, or side wall to side wall, through that truss assembly. And then the mechanical contractor comes in and cuts it all to heck. And so you basically have now severed that strong backing which what it's basically doing is, is it to help mitigate the vibration, is it's helping to dampen that vibration, taking that vibration out through the strong backing to the sidewalls, and you want the connection to be adequate to prevent lateral movement. So again, these items are very important and you know running it as continuous as possible. Minimum over it, it should each strong back, if you have to, uh, cut sections of the strong backing out, you want to replace those as close to the sections that you, that, that you removed, and that shorter section should be a minimum of three trusses. Okay, for more information on this, um, I would uh, certainly recommend that you visit the SBC Industry website or the SBCA website at sbcindustry.com. And for more information regarding uh, trust deflection limits, for floor trusses and also floor vibration causes and control methods. Um, there's a couple of research reports that I've uh, got the covers shown here. So appreciate you uh, listening to me drone on. Hopefully I haven't put too many of you guys to sleep, um, but I want to thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I think we could probably take a couple of questions real quickly for those of you that are still on. Um, otherwise, you can certainly get a hold of me if you have questions. Uh, my direct line is 608. 310-6703. Thank you very much.